Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We're here today on our Wellness and Weight Loss Wednesday show talking about the four PCOS subtypes, brand new research that I wanted to bring you. I know we talked about PCOS in the past. We talked about the different root causes. If you're unfamiliar with those, I'm certainly going to link up those previous shows as well as um, just do a quick recap of the underlying root cause of PCOS. Just because, um, again, remember, everything has an underlying root cause, even Alzheimer's, like we talked about yesterday on the show and how it's linked to a certain blood type. So definitely check out that show if you didn't. You can find all shows at Stephen cabral.com forward slash podcasts. Um, but for PCOS, you have to understand is like people can say all they want that it's genetic. Medical doctors can dismiss you just saying that, you know, you need to exercise more. You need to eat better. You need to, um, you know, reduce toxins you need, but you have to understand like there's so much that we know about PCOS and the underlying root causes and how to reverse it and rebalance the body. And we see people every single day in our practice uh, with PCOS. And you have to understand is that it's not just us, right? Like I don't ever want to make this seem like we are doing something that the, I would say top level practitioners don't know about. They do. Great practitioners who do the research, who are willing to study, who have made this that their their life's work, they know this. And so I just want you to know that there are people that you can reach out to, uh, whether it's the Integrative Health Practitioner Network, whether it's uh, naturopathic doctors in your area that might specialize in hormones. And But it's not just hormones. That's the thing. is like you don't want a specialist. So Jim, let me just take one second. In order to be able to help any chronic-based dis ease, you don't want a specialist. I'm probably gonna have to do a, a whole podcast on this. And the reason is that PCOS is not just about hormones. I'm about to share with you the four subtypes and actually how it's hormone based. But the underlying root causes are not hormones. That's the wild thing about it. And so it's like you go to a cardiovascular doctor because you might have, let's say, high cholesterol. And again, I'm just using this as an example. Well, your high, high cholesterol, most likely, most likely, the only culprit is not your diet, right? I mean, like most likely it has all sorts of inflammatory processes. Like again, high cholesterol can be caused by low levels of estrogen after menopause in women. It can be caused by lower levels of thyroid anytime in your life. It can be caused by an APOE4 variant, you know, gene variant. Like, so here's the thing, but your cardiovascular specialist will most likely never talk to you about these specific things. They'll most likely never test for those specific things. And if they do, well, what are they going to do? They're still going to put you on a statin, right? And so like, it's, it, it's the game. That's the way the game is played with conventional medicine. And it's fine for 99% of the people because they're okay with that. And they're, they're okay with being on the medication. But I know if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not one of those people. You want to go deeper. Even if you're on a stat right now, even if you're on medication, I have no problem with that. I support that. Do what you need to do until you find and figure out the underlying root cause, rebalance the body, then work with your doctor to be able to wean off of it. That's a smart way to do it. Anyway. That was a little side. Like I said, I'm probably going to have to do a show on that. But um, if you're un unfamiliar with PCOS, uh, I, I want to go over what the main symptoms are for women because it's affecting one in every 10 women. And it might even be greater than that. Right now, they found in India, new study I just read, one in, well, one in every five, 20 to 25% of all women in India, at least premenopause, are affected with P uh, PCOS. And I thought that was remarkable because these the numbers just continue to grow. So there is definitely something going on in our world that is causing the multiplicity of this particular dis-ease of the body to continue to climb. So what are the symptoms of PCOS? So polycystic ovaries, right? So what are the symptoms? Well, that's not really a sim symptom, right? So polycystic ovaries is not a symptom. The symptoms would be facial hair growth. It might be thinning of the hair on top of the head. It could be uh, excessive hair growth on other parts of the body, thickening of the hair. It also could be oily skin or adult-based acne. It could be water retention, like puffiness of the body, like you're, you feel like you're swollen, not just weight gain. Yes, some women with PCOS do gain weight, but some just feel swollen, like their body is literally retaining too much water. And we, again, we hear this every single day in our practice. So we work with both men and women in our practice, but our, our practice is, you know, about two thirds or 70% women. And so we see this every single day, we work with thousands of people every single month. And we also see low mood. It's not just the body, but lower mood. 
We see menstrual cycle dysregularity. We see infertility. We see pen, uh, painful uh, menstrual cycles as well. And then overall slow metabolic function. What does that mean? Well, slow metabolic function could be anything from uh, cold hands, cold feet, kind of like a lower thyroid-based symptom or dry skin or, or many, many issues like brain fog as well. So again, when we're talking about PCOS, we're not talking about really polycystic ovaries. Maybe we are. But really what we're trying to do is end the suffering of all of these symptoms that women are experiencing, and we can do that. But now what I wanted to share with you, because if you're not already familiar, and you go to your endocrinologist, or you go to your uh, OB or OBGYN, you have to understand is they might put you in one of these four new categories. So let me share them with you before you heard it anywhere else, right? So they're looking at uh, what they call phenotype A. Okay, so let me explain phenotype. So there's basically a genotype, which is you and your genetics, okay? So let's say you're, you're born and you are um, perfectly healthy and you have totally normal cholesterol. And then all of a sudden you're 32 years old and you go to your doctors and your doctor's like, hey, your cholesterol is 310, your total cholesterol. You have really high cholesterol. And you're like, why do I have high cholesterol? I eat well, I do this, I do that. Your doc and your doctor's like, well, it's probably just genetic, right? So that's your, geno that's your genotype, right? Your genetics, you're more prone to high cholesterol. It doesn't mean you have to high have high cholesterol because you didn't have it before the age of 32. Why'd you have it at 32, right? So you didn't have to have it. It's in your genes, but those genes didn't express themselves until something happened in your life and we call that the phenotype. So your phenotype is what you become with these genes of yours, right? How you express your genes. It's epigenetics and it becomes you as your phenotype. So in Ayurveda, they have the Vakriti and they have the Prakriti, you know? One is your actual, right? The Prakriti is your actual genotype. And then you have your Vakriti, which is essentially how, what we become. So we want to understand that uh, we are, our genes are not our destiny. Uh, but in terms of PCOS, there are four different ways to look at what we become, right? So phenotype A is hyperandrogenism. That just simply means higher levels of what are typically considered male uh, dominant hormones. So more of the androgens, like higher levels of testosterone and or DHEA, even androstene dion or androstene dion, um, would be considered that as well. Interesting diol too. So these are just kind of precursors to testosterone uh, as well. And yes, men and women, they both have these. So it's not like women are not supposed to have testosterone. They are just not to the level that men would have, which is why if testosterone starts to get higher in women, well, they can have uh, potentially more inflammation, but they can have the hair growth, deepening of the voice, hair loss on the top of the head, uh, acne, and other based issues as well. Okay. So hyper androgenism, uh, ovulatory dysfunction, so issue issues with the menstrual cycle, and polycystic ovaries. All right, so that's phenotype A. Phenotype A, I'm just going to say, instead of staying hyperandrogenism every time, I'm just going to say high testosterone, all right? So high testosterone, uh, dysregulated menstrual cycle, and polycystic ovaries, that's phenotype A. Phenotype B is hyper androgenism, I just said I wouldn't say that, uh, high testosterone and ovulatory dysfunction, all right? So same as A, but not the polycystic ovaries because it's not the only classification, right? Phenotype C is the high testosterone, but no ovulatory dysfunction, right? So no menstrual cycle dysfunction, but polycystic ovaries. And then phenotype D is no high testosterone, but menstrual cycle dysregularities, and polycystic ovaries, all right? So we have three phenotypes with higher testosterone. And then the uh, variations of those three are menstrual cycle dysregularities or polycystic ovaries or both. And the last one is no high testosterone or androgens, uh, but menstrual cycle dysregularity and polycystic ovaries. All right, so those are the four main types. And I wanted just to, to give you a few more notes on this study. So, um, what I wanted to share with you was that in healthy women, so when we're talking, because three of the four phenotypes have high testosterone, right, or high androgens, which again, I said are testosterone, androstene dion, androstene diol, uh, and you may even include DHEA in that, but it's not necessarily part of the factors because it's a precursor uh, to testosterone. So um, 40 to 50% of a woman's testosterone is actually produced in the ovaries and the adrenal glands, um, and then postmenopause typically in the adrenals. So when we're looking at these specific uh, phenotypes, we also saw some interesting correlations, especially with 
uh, PCOS phenotype A, which basically combined everything. All right. So this one combines the menstrual cycle dysregularities, polycystic ovaries, as well as the high testosterone, high androgens. So higher levels of insulin, higher levels of triglycerides, higher levels of CRP, highly sensitive CRP, which is the C-reactive protein, uh, lower levels of estriol, which is a protective form of estrogen. They had uh, lower levels of sex hormone binding globulin, HDL cholesterol, so the good cholesterol, and lower levels of vitamin D compared to controls. So you can see that inflammation was rampant in phenotype A. So that has to tell you something. Because inflammation, you could say, well, that's part of the root cause. True. But inflammation is never the bottom foundational root cause because it is always caused by something else. So please keep that in mind for one moment because we can start to then see what the underlying root causes are. All right. And then in phenotype D, which was um, everything but the higher androgens, they had lower levels of vitamin D, okay, but significantly higher levels of cortisol. And that included uh, all types of cortisol dysregulation, okay? So it could be high, could be low, could be high. In the, actually, they only did one reading, so that's the issue with a lot of these cortisols is they just do the one reading. So that's that. All right, so now when we're talking about PCOS, and again, I'm going to link up my previous shows as to how to overcome PCOS, and I've done a few shows now on it, because again, when anything affects one in 10 women, we need to really be talking about this to a greater degree because it could be as low as one out of five women. They just may not be diagnosed yet. So... We talked about, okay, high androgens, menstrual cycle dysregularity, polycystic ovaries, but why? Inflammation, okay, but why? Here's the thing. This is what we find over and over and over in our practice, and I go in depth, like, like I said on a previous podcast. Higher levels of cortisol, typically in the evening, so then it disrupts sleep. Higher levels of cortisol also can lead to lower levels of progesterone, which then leads to estrogen dominance, which is almost all of the same symptoms that I stated at the beginning of the show. Higher levels of cortisol, which means by, when you think cortisol, just think stress. Higher levels of stress can also decrease thyroid. Very interesting because thyroid can also lead to poor circulation hair loss or thinning of the hair, cold hands and feet, um, what else? Dry skin, brain fog, right? Like all of these things. So interesting. We've got cortisol, we have thyroid, we have estrogen dominance, but we also have higher levels of blood sugar. Blood sugar can absolutely disrupt the adrenals. They can disrupt the thyroid, but also the thyroid and the adrenals can disrupt blood sugar. You can see how this can be a vicious cycle. So you never just work on one thing. Any practitioner that tells you, you just need to do this one thing, like eat this one food and you'll be cured, or drink this one smoothie and you'll be cured, or do this one thing. Like It's never one thing. Smoothies are great. Foods are great. Supplements are great. Meditation is great. It's typically never one thing. You need to figure out what that root cause is, and it's usually multiple, and begin to work on it. Also, vitamin D is a crucial factor. Almost no one is talking about vitamin D. I'm so happy that at least this study started to share with people that vitamin D is a factor. Low vitamin D is a factor in PCOS, estrogen dominance, low thyroid, and many more, even cholesterol metabolism. Here's the thing, though. There's a lot of, there, there's, I know people do not mean any harm, and I, so I appreciate this, and, and I'm very sensitive to the topic, but there's a lot of people telling you that you should not be using vitamin D3 as a supplement. I would be careful with that advice, because unless you are getting adequate sun exposure, you are most likely low in vitamin D. And if you're low in vitamin D, you leave yourself greatly susceptible to all sorts of diseases in the body. Vitamin D is crucial for our immune system and well over 300 other processes in the body. So again, just give caution. And the last one that I want to share with you is, uh, well, two more, I guess. Overall toxicity. So plastics, uh, heavy metals, except pesticides, all of these things can affect inflammation and toxicity. And the last one is your gut health. Um, I did a podcast previous to this on the link between PCOS and gut health. I'm going to link up that as well, uh, but so crucial because oftentimes you can't figure it out. You can't fix things because the inflammation will not go away and it won't go away until you fix that intestinal permeability, candida overgrowth, SIBO, parasites, H. pylori, whatever it might be. So you know, the bottom line is this, uh, work with a practitioner, because this is complicated, right? But work with a practitioner that's able to help you just work the process. Ideally, that practitioner is going to run the big five labs with you, 
or at the very, very least, they're going to run the starter kit plus the stress mood and metabolism test at the very least. Uh, and if you can only do one lab, then I would do the stress mood and metabolism. You can find all of these labs at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. You don't need to run them with us in our practice. You can if you want to, but you don't need to. You can work with your local functional medicine doctor, local naturopathic doctor, or um, IHP2, integrative health practitioner too. Your choice. But you have to understand is that it's a puzzle. Every woman's slightly different with their underlying root causes. You find the underlying root causes. You take about three to four months to begin to rebalance those. Then you begin to recreate equilibrium and homeostasis with the body. Once you do that, you have to remember that dis-ease cannot live in the body at that point. A healthy body cannot be sick. A healthy body cannot be unbalanced. So hopefully this was helpful. I'm always happy to do additional follow-up shows. These are by your uh, popular demand. You write in, you let me know the topics you want me to speak about, and that's what I do. Thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate you for all of the show notes and links. Head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2343. 